Hi, it is so nice to see you guys. I'm using StreamYard again, so it looks just a little bit different to me. I am expecting um, my son, Jonathan, to join, and I am also expecting a spe another special guest, so we'll see if they join in. So we really have like a minute until we get started, so here I am. I'm going to actually pull us up on my other computer so I can I can see I heard my husband I heard my voice from my husband's computer he was there so that's kind of fun oh there is my son Jonathan so oh I like your name Jonathan Van son you like that better than Van spawn so. it's more descriptive yes maybe could you turn your volume up a little bit or maybe I have mine low what does your shirt say Oh, dad says your volume's fine. Okay. Um, what is um, what does your shirt say? Fuel the fuel the future. It's it's a Capital One departmental slogan. Oh, okay, that's his work. So, um, well, um, Michael hasn't joined in yet, but I think we can go ahead and get started because it is seven o'clock. So I have been looking forward to this ever since I picked this book and. Um, I, before we jump into discussing it, I'll just mention a little bit about why I picked it. So I think like everybody else, I've always loved that story of Camelot. I always liked the movie and the songs. I, I can sing so many of the songs and it's, it's so fun. But then there were some other movie treatments of it that I really liked. And then one day I checked out of the library, this really um, old book, like it was so old, you know, those kind that have like a cover that has no picture whatsoever. It's just a solid cover and it has like the name sketched in on it. They're, they're yeah, maybe, maybe like a line of a trim kind of color. So like the cover is solid green and there's like a line of gold and yes, something like that. Exactly. And the name of the book, I'm putting it in the chat. The name of the book was The Sword at Sunset. And it was a different take on Arthurian legend than I had ever read before. It was like the Arthur of the military history, like defending against Saxon invasion. And it was so good and so powerful that it just captivated me. And when I was doing my degree in English in college, I took a class on Arthurian legend, like the whole class, all it was was Arthurian legend. We read a ton of them. And it was after that, that I really realized how, if, if you haven't read Arthurian legend, if you don't understand it, you will not understand like half of what, what you read. Um, so, hey, I'm super excited because here is Michael. Ah! Okay, Hello. so you guys, this is Michael Deb Coatney. He is um, joining in this time, and this is a different way we're doing it. Instead of a PowerPoint slide deck, we're doing it as a discussion. And if you didn't get the email about it and you would like to participate in this, um, just shoot me an email and let me know because we have some spaces coming up. So, so tonight it is me and Jonathan and Michael, and we are going to be talking about the book. Michael, I just got finished talking about how important, um, Arthurian legend is to understanding anything in the Western canon, really, like it is ev almost every story you read is a remix of in some way um, of the Arthurian legend. So that was why I picked Arthurian legend. And the way that I picked this book is that I felt like it did a good job of, um, I felt like it did a good job of capturing the main arc of the legend without being too deep and it and the way it was divided all up into vignettes instead of one big long story arc was was pretty good um and it, it fit our purposes it feels approachable because the book itself is so small so um yeah, like kind of like it's sort of lost i don't know I like it was a little bit too on a couple of things but mm. I just am hearing wonkiness, Michael, from your audio. Yeah, it sounds robot. Um, I wonder if it's internet connection, maybe. 
You know, that's fine. Oh, there it was. Jonathan, were you hearing it? Real yeah, body? yeah, I'm getting the, it's, it's lagging. Hmm. Okay, well, hopefully it'll be better. Michael, can you try, oh, there went Michael, baby, he's going to come back in. So I, well, before, when we get started, the first thing I almost always do, that was, that was wise of Michael to like go out and come back in just to see if that got better. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Do you want to say again what you just said? Okay. Uh, I felt like the the Roger Lancelin Green, King Arthur, and the Knights of the Round Table sort of glossed over a couple of things. Like, not necessarily glossed over, but described too briefly. I like long descriptions. So. Yeah, it does. It, it is this weird blend because every now and then you'll get this prosaic text and then the next thing is like, and then he cut off her head, you know, and yeah. like, oh, okay. But I think when you get in, like some of the ones I've read that are longer, like the Chrétien de Troyes and the Mallory and even Steinbeck's treatment, they are three times as long. So mm. you kind of have to pay one way or another. Wait, All Steinbeck right. did a King Arthur? Oh, I need to yeah, read that. Yeah, he did. That's awesome. Um, okay, on a scale of one to five, everybody in the chat, let me see. Oh, there we go. Yes, book one for tonight. Looking at the chat there. Um, book one for tonight. And so book one, want to give me a rating from one to five? Ready? I am totally ready, totally ready for your decimals. Let's see. Um, Strudel Kitty saying, it was very calmingly paced in a way like a simple story being told with a very narrational way you could tell it was passed down or oh and mark c yeah. saying couldn't keep track of characters yeah you know what that was a bit confusing it is so confusing it is so confusing i'm gonna <clears throat> change this because the sense. characters are tough because everybody's the greatest in the room or mm -hmm. in the right. whole and, and there's all these people who are the greatest, but they're the greatest in the future, and they're just being called out now. They're not yeah. showing up yet. So, so there's like 15 greatest <laughs> to track. I don't even know how many times I had to look back and try to figure out uh, who in the heck this person is that they're talking about. I totally, totally agree. I love Cloud Fall say, longer is better, but, <laughs> right? Like, so rounding it to a four, that's so fun. Um, it, it is true. And the characters are hard to keep track of. So if you read, I know a lot of people skip the front matter, mm. but if you read that introduction by David Almond, I thought it was so sweet. Like he had, he talks about how he he tugged it from a Christmas stocking one Christmas morning. And I could just see him as a kid doing that. And I thought it was so sweet. And I was wondering, yeah. Do you either, and when I say you, I mean Jonathan, Michael, or anyone in the um, in the chat. You guys have. Do you have any memories of receiving a particular book? Like, do you remember getting any book in particular? My parents gave me. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. Um, it's a book about a boy whose friend drowns in the river, and then he he tries That's to cover it up. Hmm. I don't know what it's called. I not remember receiving piece? that and being made really sad by it. <gasps> like not a separate piece? What do you mean? Well, a separate that, piece. No. The guy I don't think that's what it's called. Wasn't that? Okay. Um, I know his boy drowns. In the I river. could go find it. Maybe. Okay, you need to find it. Copy. I can do that right now if you want. Yeah, go get it. Okay, I'll be right back. Go get it, because inquiring minds want to know. Okay, Strudel Kitty remembers getting magic for Easter. I remember getting Little Women um, for Christmas when I was had just turned 10. How about you, Jonathan? Do you remember any books in particular that you've received? Um, uh, it wasn't technically a book I received. I just remember pretty vividly one time that my little brother received a book and I managed to steal it before he'd even cracked it open and I read it before he got a chance to, so. For those of you who know Jonathan, you will know that that is 100% his MO. <laughs> um, so Scrittle Kitty said she can even remember the way the room smelled. Isn't that crazy how memory is just so powerful? Hello to you, Lee. That's nice it. On my honor. Yeah. Michael, what'd you find it? What's it called? On my honor. Yeah. On my honor. I've not even heard of it. But maybe I don't want to read it because it's sad, but you remember getting it. Like, yeah. 
Okay, that's cool. Um, My parents got me a whole bunch of different Newbery, uh, especially like Newbery Award winning books one year. So the Newbery Award is so weird because it only has one R and it's Newbery. really hard to spell Newbery with one R. In the, um, <laughs> in the author's note, in the author's note, there's this last quote. So this is the author, Roger Lancelin Green. And he says, but the great legends, like the best of the fairy tales, must be retold from age to age. There's always something new to be found in them. And each retelling brings them freshly and more vividly before a new generation. And therein lies their immortality. Mm. And so I have questions for you two. And obviously, any question I ask is not just for Jonathan and Michael, but for everyone, which is, um, what do you think of that idea? Is it necessary for every generation to retell the story for themselves? Or can some stories survive well having never been retold? Mm. I think it probably depends on the story. Uh, there are always gonna be things that fall out of vogue that, I don't know, just even if it's terms that are used that aren't necessarily relevant anymore, uh, yeah. We've seen that in some of the stories that we've read where there were words that didn't really make sense. And that kind of thing makes a story interesting to read, but it can often uh, lose some of its meaning for further generations. When you're having to look stuff up, <clears throat> excuse me, what it says. Cloudfall is talking about when she got this Star Wars novel for her birthday and she was so excited because like, and it's, it's, it's mm. books are so powerful. Let's see what Mark has to say. He says he does remember his mom reading the first few chapters of Percy Jackson and then her t yeah. telling her to go away so he could read it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because I read out loud to the kids all the time. And now I wonder if like, do you, Jonathan, do you have any books that you particularly remember me reading? Uh, read Little House on the Prairie, Harry Potter. Yeah. My mom did yeah. that. Those series, honestly, the not just series, a yeah. book. We did Narnia, little, yeah, all the Little House books. Um, this mm. is uh, Lee says it's weird, but as you get older, you find the retelling more valuable. I think that is such a good point. Like sometimes it's the books you read, and then you reread them, and that's it's cool. Mm -hmm. Well, let's dive in. Well, yeah, and here's another cool point from Lee about people love hearing their parents retell stories about when they were young, like when mm -hmm. either when the parents were young or when the kid was young, you know, um, and Clavel says, depends on the era, like how similar are the themes still applicable? Could mm -hmm. they still understand it as, <laughs> as well? That's a good point. Cloudfall. I like what Cloudfall points out. Plus I think it's also a question of how abstract the story is. Mm -hmm. So yeah. for instance, a lot of Shakespeare stuff, like the, like Hamlet is so abstract. You can tell the story with lions. <laughs> And it still transfers almost identically. <laughs> and then other thing, other stories I think are on the opposite side of the spectrum of being very concrete, like To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. To Kill a Mockingbird is capturing a snapshot of a historical situation where the emphasis is on the details of the historical situation. Like you can abstract it and start trying to apply stuff, but it's very specifically about a very specific cultural situation. Mm -hmm. It's very so, rooted. King yeah. Arthur is abstract enough that you can make King Arthur myths in all sorts of settings, all sorts of scenarios, different time periods, different cultures. King Arthur is like the story of, it, it can be transferred very readily. And I think I mean, it, part, of, part of the thing with King Arthur is that it's such a, a foundational piece of English literature, right? Uh, yeah, you can't. You cannot understand, especially Western literature, without understanding it. So the first line of chapter one, I'm just going to, let's dive in then. Let's dive in. The first line of chapter one is saying, it says, after wicked King Vortigern had first invited the Saxons to settle in Britain and help him to fight the Picts and Scots, the land was never at peace. And I just think this is such a universal idea that we often invite the enemy in. And, and that is one of the storylines that you're going to see over and over and over in literature is this idea that oftentimes you will be the one who inadvertently invites the enemy and in, that the enemy doesn't necessarily 
invade you or break everything down, but in fact has been welcomed in and then becomes a problem. Um, mm. So I, uh, and then, okay, it's not really a question, but just an observation. I do have a question though. Um, so in, in chapter one here, one of the first things that happens is that Uther Pendragon falls in love with Gorla's wife. And, um, and in my, in, in my way of thinking, that is really the inciting incident. Like, because mm -hmm. there are three legitimate Pendragon daughters, including Morgan Le Fay, who is to Arthurian legend what Bellatrix Lestrange is to Harry Potter. And interestingly, in movies, were both portrayed by the same actress. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Um, and so we've got these three legitimate daughters and then this like mystery child. And we usually think that the inciting incident in Arthurian legend is the pulling of the sword from the stone. But I actually think mm. it is this moment when Arthur falls for Gorla's wife and then that results in this magic mystery baby in Arthur being born. I'm pulling up before, before you guys give me your thoughts on that. I think this is a good Ethan's idea that like the Trojan horse, like the enemy we invite in. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then Mark, like Greek hero <laughs> stopping prophecies and making the prophecies worse. Yes, exactly. Yeah, good point. Okay, so what do you guys think about that inciting incident? either Jonathan or Michael or anybody at home. What are your thoughts? I think that the pulling of the sword from the stone is the inciting incident in Arthur's story, but in the, the broader story at large, yeah, I think you're right. But, Ooh, I never thought about that. I mean, you've got yeah, individual like stories in the story of these of different Camelot. heroes. In the, in the story, well, not even of Camelot, in the story of Logris, like this idea of like heaven on earth, that then they could have a different inciting incident than Arthur's own story arc. That's that's interesting. And I've only gotten to the uh, I've only gotten through the first uh, part, but I'm wondering once you get to the other famous heroes like Sir Gawain or Sir Lancelot, do they have their own inciting incidents? Might be interesting to keep an eye out for. Yes, definitely. Let's do that. Let's keep an eye out for whether each of them have their own. That's kind of interesting. I mean, I guess you could argue that Guinevere's inciting incident is when Arthur falls in love with her. Mm. Like, and then that sets her story in motion. Otherwise, she was just some, you know, sitting pretty and quiet daughter of a king. Yeah. Um, Mark says, meet in the middle and say when Sir Kay loses his sword. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Um, so let's see. Um, so then we come to the sword in the stone. Why is this imagery so powerful? Why is this imagery of a, a sword being stuck in a stone and then being pulled out by this boy from nowhere, a foster child of a knight? Why is why is this such a powerful image? I mean, one of a lot of people's favorite Disney movie is the sword in the stone. Mm. Something about the oh. Implacability of stone, maybe. Well, I'm. I, sort of yeah. there. I mean, we can see echoes of this in a lot of in a ridiculous number of video games, <laughs> especially Legend of Zelda being a notable one of this. There's so many instances where you encounter like a a stand or an altar, and there's a magical weapon right on top of it that's super important for you to get, or that unlocks something when you take it, and it's just like I can picture. I don't even know if this game exists. I can just picture somebody walks into like a giant temple and there's a golden AK-47 on a shrine. And it would it feels very natural to say, well, now that's the AK-47 of legend. This is this is not a retelling. No, it's, plus iron is an interesting the metal for the game. I think it's possible that it taps into this kind of universal desire to be like special and that if your power could just be unveiled and we see it in Lord of the Rings when Aragorn is the one who can take the sword of, of is it Elendil or Arendil? Uh, and it's like the broken. Shards of Isildur? Isildur, yeah, Isildur's sword, but it had a name. And 
Ellen Deal. Well, no, they, dad knows. Dad's it, like was Nars- it was Narsil, and then it was renamed when it was reforged. When it was reforged. Mm-hmm. And so it's like that idea that only the rightful king can can do that. Yeah. Um, I'm sure it. that Tolkien pulled out of uh, Arthurian legend. Oh, a hundred percent. Like you can see when you read, if you have read, if you've read Lord of the Rings or watched the movies and then you read Arthur, you'll be like, oh, <laughs> man, everything's a remix. Yeah. Um, so the three gifts made by the three gifts to Arthur made by the dwellers in Avalon. So Avalon is like this mysterious lake place where the kind of fairies are essentially. Um, And these were the three gifts, that he would be the best of all knights, that he would be the greatest king the land had ever known, and that he would live longer than any man would ever know. And I wanna know, what do you think is the best of those three gifts? To be either the best of all knights, the greatest king the land would ever know, or to live longer than any man. So while you guys are thinking about that, let me go highlight Just a couple of Tuck comments. Everlasting, I'm not gonna go with that third one. Um, <laughs> no. Ooh, I like I like the third one because it's, it's an interesting mm. contrast with a lot of Greek mythology. Mm. Like Achilles would have answered choice number three without any hesitation whatsoever. <laughs> Eternal glory, is the ultimate prize as far as most of Western history is concerned. Well, and one of the most famous treatments of Arthur is T.H. White's Once and Future King, the idea that Arthur will come back. But I think maybe, I don't know, like, would it matter if he came back if he hadn't been the greatest king the land had ever known? Like, Mm. it established England in its whole view of itself, right? Okay, so Ethan says, greatest king because you aren't just helping yourself, okay? Um, yeah. yeah, Mark is funny. I like how Arthur just randomly finds a sword and an anvil under a tent and thinks it's completely normal. <laughs> oh, let me just um, take this and bring it to my brother. I know, exactly. <laughs> I don't know right? what here, but okay. It really um, needs a sword. Well, and we've got, um, we've got sword machinations going on here because Arthur receives Excalibur from the Lady of the Lake after that situation with Sir, Sir Pelinor, but we're like, wait, how is he getting the sword now? Didn't he already pull it out of the stone? And in some versions of the story, there is just one sword and that the sword in the stone is Excalibur. But in some versions of the story, including this one, um, the swords are separate. And when they are separate, the sword that is pulled from the stone is not Excalibur. The sword pulled from the stone is, it it has a couple names, usually Clarent um, and sometimes Caliburn. Caliburn, which I think sounds more swordy than than Clarent. Clarent sounds too much like Clarence and Uh, that's not swordy. so, but Caliburn is is this sword in this one. Now, Arthur thinks it's the mm. sword that's important, but really it's the scabbard and the, the thing that you put the sword in. And I love this idea that we sometimes mistake what's really valuable. And we're gonna see that over and over as a trope in all kinds of literature that you, you think one thing is what's valuable or one person and finding out that it's, that it's wrong. So it's, it's the weird. scabbard like a, uh... A symbol for peace or something? I don't really know. Like the, the scabbard is the thing that is storing the sword. I think, I think it's probably just like, um, okay, you guys got to check out what Ethan just said. I shall smite thee down with Clarence. I mean, it just doesn't work, does it? Like it just, it doesn't <laughs> no, work. <not> really? <laughs> you're right. You're right. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. I mean, scabbards. It would be interesting to try and pick apart the symbolism of the scabbard specifically, because we tend to think of it more in terms of, oh, you put the sword away. That's where you put the sword. Mm-hmm. But the scabbard, especially if you look at the imagery, because when they talk about pulling the sword from the stone, they talk about pulling it from a well-oiled scabbard. And so the scabbard is, mm-hmm. to a certain extent, you're, how quickly you can spring to violence when necessary. 
yeah. and how much you can protect your ability to be violent when necessary. The scabbard's primary purpose is to protect the blade. See, I'm saying more and more that points me towards thinking that the scabbard is a symbol for peace and the sword for war. So, yeah, the better the no. peace is, the more quickly you can ready yourself for war. It does match one of the more powerful themes of Arthur's legacy, which is all the kings had swords. Every king waged war. Vortigern waged war, and we think he's a terrible king. Arthur's the guy who gets to put the sword away and have peace, mm. even if just for a little bit. And that is somewhat unique. It's it's meant to be unique. That's, that's an interesting take. Mm -hmm. In this chapter of Balin and Balin, so these two brothers, um, and it, it I'm could gonna be cry. Balin, it could be Balin. <laughs> it's the saddest story. Um, it's a saddest story, but it's interesting because in this chapter, we meet um, one of Arthur's proudest and cruelest enemies, who is King Ryan. And then on page 26, we read that there are other powers of evil warring against Logris. And, and I think I want to just mention that in this story, you're going to hear Logris and Camelot. Camelot was an actual location. Camelot was the location at Winchester where Arthur had his like headquarters. But the the kingdom was Logris, which was like God's kingdom on earth, this utopia. So Logris or Logres was the utopian kind of society and its capital was Camelot. Hmm. So just like we would say something like, well, in Washington today, meaning like the United States, we will, which is a, it, this is a literary a literary technique where we will have like uh, Camelot representing all of Logris and Camelot has become the name that's really common. And we've got another sword here pulled by another faded, very virtuous knight. Mm -hmm. And there is such a strong emphasis here in both of these things, these powers of magic, like the role of magic and then the role of destiny. I think magic and destiny just play such strong roles in all this. It keeps coming up over and over and over again. Do you, which do you think is more important, the magic or the destiny? Destiny. Who magic. else has an idea? Do you guys agree with Michael? I said the magic still plays a pretty minor role. You have magicians like Merlin and the occasional evil sorcerer, right? But and of course the main sorceress Morgan Le Fay, but I feel like basically everybody has some sort of destiny that they must fulfill. Okay, that's interesting. I think, mm, what do you think, Jonathan? Well, it's, <clears throat> it's an interesting question because destiny rarely is seen to actually do anything mm. aside from set it, Magic tends, but even the magic tends to be quite passive most of the time. It rarely directly affects a, lo a lot of the main characters. That's true. Should we pause and wait for Strolls Kitty to go get a snack? Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would go with Destiny because Destiny is a more common influence, it seems. Okay. And magic, magic in this story rarely seems to backfire directly on the person who casts it, but Destiny does not care. You touch the wrong sword, and it's going to burn you. Destiny Magic often, no mercy. or practically always, influences destiny. But how often does destiny influence magic? Interesting. Mm. If we count Merlin as the embodiment of magic pretty heavily. I guess that's true. Mm. Well, we could talk about this all night. That, <laughs> I didn't realize that was such a good question. So, um, so Balin steps forward and is able to pull this sword out. And unfortunately, he falls in love with it. And he mm. refuses to he become so obsessed with it that he refuses to return it to the woman to whom it actually belongs. And if there's one thing to take away from, um, if there's one thing to take away from Arthurian legend, it is that if something is destined to belong to somebody else and you mess with it, the magic mm. will come find you, right? Mm. Um, it will never work out well for you. And it's, of course, it's a magic weapon aren't they all? Um, and now it's cursed and he's gonna kill the man he loves best in the world um, with it. 
And it made me think of when I read this part of Balan falling in love with his sword, it made me think of exactly what Ian ju Ethan just said. This is exactly what oh, it made me think that's of. that's funny. With Gollum and the my precious. And I just thought that was exactly what I thought, Ethan. Oh my gosh, that is so funny. That was exactly what I thought. And I was wondering if you guys could think of any other stories in which we see someone fall in obsession with um, a cursed object or something that then leads to their downfall. I feel like there's something like this in Harry Potter, isn't there? It sounds like a Harry well, Potter Maybe thing. like the Mirror of Arased? Maybe. Maybe. Or like, oh, what? what's the name of the the magic? I, I haven't read Harry Potter in years. But magic, the magic uber powerful wand? No, yeah, the wand, the Elder uber wand? powerful wand. Oh. Doesn't it have multiple names? The Death Stick, the Elder yeah, it's, Twig, or something like that? The Elder Wand is like the uh, the Vorpal Blade of Harry Potter. Yeah. Every, in order to gain it, you have to kill somebody, and every time it kills somebody, it gets stronger. I feel like that's the same kind of thing. Everybody's trying to get it, and anybody who does ends up dying. Yeah, okay, so then we could do the same thing with like the Holy Grail, which is obviously mm -hmm. in here as well. So it's just an interesting idea. So um, an interesting character makes an appearance here who is the Lady of the Lake. So the Lady of the Lake is this really interesting Arthurian um, character because she manifested herself in many, many ways in different versions of the legend. So there can be different people called the Lady of the Lake. The one that is in here is Nimue, sometimes pronounced Nineveh. Um, mm -hmm. and even Morgan Le Fay, though, in some versions of it, is called the Lady of the Lake. But here, the Lady of the Lake is different. Okay. And she definitely saves Arthur's tush a few times, and we're going to see that. Um, but Balin cuts off her head and is sent <laughs> away. So that's like his inciting incident is to pull the sword, and then it ends up being really bad for him. He kills Sir Lansor and Sir Lansor's girlfriend, who loves Sir Lancer more than life itself, kills Shakespeare much. And it's so melodramatic. It just feels so melodramatic to us. And I'm wondering, what do you guys think about this, like, melodramatic, over-the-top, almost triteness in the story? It just feels, it, it borders on the, like, lapstick <laughs> comedy sometimes. See, this almost reminds me of the sort of, language used in the Odyssey and the Iliad. Mm. Maybe that's, I don't know, maybe something that we don't understand in our modern age, but that was a more powerful tool in storytelling in times longer ago, I don't know. Jonathan, when you and I were talking about the other day, you had an insight I thought was interesting about this. Do you remember what it was? When you said it seems trite because we hear, like, because it's the root of all stories. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm. we, we think it's trite because we hear that and like, oh, it's Romeo and Juliet. Well, Romeo and Juliet probably came second. Mm. Yeah, like that it feels overdone and overused and tired because we hear it and see it in so many different things. Um, yeah. So it, they give us some, um, the, the foreshadowing in here is not subtle mm. because he's cursed that he's gonna kill the man he loves most in the world and then Balan's brother finds him there, and the, and the narrator flat out tells us his brother, whom he loved better than <laughs> any in the world, is like, hello, like, guess what's going to happen? And there's there's no response to that except row, ro, right? Because we know what's going to happen. <laughs> this does bring up an interesting point. Now, later, we're going to establish the rules of chivalry, but the instant somebody tells you you're going to kill the person you love the most, I would immediately decide that every time I was about to try and kill somebody, I would let them know who I was. Mm. Yeah, but then you'd be trying to cheat destiny remember, and it wouldn't work. <laughs> the number of, the <laughs> number of people... You'd end up like accidentally poisoning him or something. Yeah. Um, spoiler <laughs> alert, but the number of people in the King Arthur legends who die or kill somebody <laughs> wrongly because they just didn't tell them who they were is really high. This is there, there are a couple of important things to take away from this book. One, don't be obsessed with swords. Yeah. Two, don't be obsessed with wearing armor. Yeah, it doesn't work. Mi yeah. The mistaken identity, like the number of people, Jonathan, you are so right, the number of people who die or almost die because of mistaken identity is like, we should be keeping tallies because it just <laughs> keeps going. 
Um, so Merlin's um, at his prophesying again. It's like his main role in this mm -hmm. version of the tale is prophesying. And he tells Balin that he's going to strike the Dolorous Stroke, which we'll get there. And, um, and we'll get to that later. And he leads them to wait for um, King Ryan, the enemy, to come by. And uh, look at Cloudfall's comment. It was like, turn out that he's actually the person you love second most, and then all of a sudden you love the person. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, or here we go. If he killed his son, his brother would die from grief, and it would still result. Mm -hmm. And here Christina has mm. what she thinks, just don't be a knight. She <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. Yes. So um, then Arthur, so they they capture him. They cap Balin and Balin capture King Ryan. And Merlin takes him back to Caerleon where Arthur is. And there's this big battle and Arthur is saved by King Pellinor. And when Merlin tells Arthur, oh, well you actually owe Balin for the victory. Merlin says the story of Balin and Balin will be the saddest of any. For he that <laughs> That's <saying> sword <laughs> is the most unfortunate of all knights. So, I think that one of the things I want to do is keep an eye out through the story for if we think this really is the saddest. As we go through the next three books, I want to, mm. coming back to the idea, is this any sadder than <laughs> Balin and Balin? Because um, Merlin says it's saddest. Um, okay, and then we get that, that dolorous stroke, which is where Balin's next adventure is that false knight, Garlon, who's going around being an invisible bad guy, which reminded me of when um, when my kids were little and they had these Fisher Price toys. And it, there used to be on cereal boxes where you could like send away for stuff and you would send in like $2.95 and they would mail you something in the mail. And we got an invisible knight to go in their yeah. Fisher Price castle. Jonathan, do you remember the invisible knight? The invisible knight was we called him the invisible knight because we were too lazy to use him properly i believe he glowed in the dark yeah oh, okay <laughs> he was even cooler i like mark c's take on this merlin's kind of a creep because he's always just giving people the info <laughs> that's so funny mark i was so surprised you didn't say you wanted to be in on this class and and show your face on here i thought for sure you'd want to participate in this i hope you will later um so he has this invisible knight and then after he kills um, the bad guy, he's being chased through the castle and he runs in and he ignores a bunch of warnings, which in Arthurian mm. legend, you should never do. Like there's another mm. lesson. Don't <laughs> ignore the warnings. And he goes into a room and grabs a random spear and stabs King Pellis with it, killing him. And of course, because this is Arthurian legend, it turns out that that spear was the actual spear that was put into the side <laughs> of Jesus and so this is the dolorous stroke. It is the unhealable wound. <laughs> and the cup that was sitting on the table just happened to be the Holy Grail that Jesus drank from. And this is the root of all Grail myth. Mm. All of the myth of finding the Holy Grail in modernity, as opposed to the loss of the Ark of the Covenant, but mm. like the search for the Holy Grail itself is is rooted here in this one story which is so interesting to me because because balan and balan were not actually knights of the round table mm -hmm. they they come before the round table and so here are these knights a new knight right in the beginning of balan's story it's like he was nothing they didn't even know him he actually just got out of prison because he'd killed one of <laughs> arthur's nephews right it's like, or cousins or something and it's like he was a nobody and yet He's the one who sets the whole grail myth in motion. It's really kind of interesting. Mm. Um, All throughout this class, I've had images of Graham Chapman like floating through my mind. <laughs> I don't know who that is. Oh, sorry. He's um, he's the guy who plays King Arthur in the Monty Python. Oh. Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Monty so, Python yeah. Grail. Okay, okay. King of the Britons. <laughs> the King of the Britons. <laughs> the spear. The feeder of the Saxons. The spear is interesting to me because I can see what it would represent allegorically if it were set today, but I have no idea what it would mean 
back then? Because today I would say it was a nuclear bomb. <laughs> because that's literally, it's like, it's as if he fired a nuke off domestically and it's <laughs> poisoned the whole countryside permanently and you need yeah. some sort of mythical thing to fix it because it was so devastating to use that weapon improperly like that. I think Merlin says it like destroys three counties or something. Yeah, it like it like ruins half the countryside immediately, yeah. irreparably, and requires a mythological item to restore ever. Mm. And I just don't get what would be a forbidden weapon in medieval Britain. Mm. Like uh, what what could like you do somebody that would else's destroy fear? half the kingdom? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that is an interesting idea. Like, what could you take? Like, I mean, they had specific rules about what clothes you were allowed to wear. So maybe there were weapons that only kings were allowed to wield. It's a spear, though. That's the weapon of the commoner. Mm -hmm. A spear with a nuclear warhead, maybe? Yes. <laughs> they didn't have but it those was a special then. spear. I mean, <laughs> it was anything sacred, right? You're not allowed to touch the scriptures. You're not allowed to touch anything sacred. The fact that you were profane and touching the sacred. Yeah, it does call him a sinner. So... I Maybe. Don't use weapons unworthily, I suppose. It's yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's a reference <laughs> to a guy who tried to start the plague to take out a rival and ends up wiping out himself. I, I don't Fire. know. There's, I don't know. To me, that so one's Balin, interesting because it's so hard to guess. Balin, it is interesting. Balin then gets in a fight with his brother, not knowing who he is, because it's not Arthurian legend if everybody <laughs> knows who they are. And he kills him, of course, in yet another case of mistaken identity. And then at the bottom of page 49, to wrap up chapter two, we get Merlin with his predictions again. And Merlin's predictions are so specific. And they're like, you're going to do this, but don't even try to escape it because then this is going to happen and that's going to be really good. But then this bad thing is going to happen. And he says exactly what it is. And I was thinking, I'd like been making notes to myself about what strong foreshadowing it was, but I don't even know if it's foreshadowing if they specifically tell you it's happening. That is very cool, Michael. Yes. <laughs> That's cute. Um, so I was Patsy. So, that is, yeah. <laughs> is it like, um, oh, there we go. We need the hashtag. We're back with our hashtags. <laughs> it's so fun to see you, Cloudball. It's so fun to see you. Um, so I, I think it's not even foreshadowing if, if they just come right out and say it. Like a foreshadow yeah. is a hint. I feel so, like a lot of what you're calling foreshadowing is like banging the reader over the head with it. Yes, so, exactly. Not very subtle. If, <laughs> Merlin's yes. like, so-and-so is going to die. Um, subtle is not an adjective anybody is going mm. to apply to Merlin. <laughs> He's not subtle. So in chapter three, we finally get to the establishment of the round table and it's the first quest of the round table. And I actually think that there is um, a little bit of author error here. Really? Yeah. So, um, okay. So what happens is Arthur brings peace and which Arthurian legend then establishes as the most important job of a ruler. So hmm. prior to this time, like if we look at the Roman empire, if we look at hmm. almost any other empire that we've seen before here, um, before this time, the role of a leader is conquest. The role of a leader is power. The role of the leader is expansionism. Peace always um, uh, often came along with that, but yeah. Yeah, and so what we've got with Arthur is the idea of that peace and like righteousness is really the goal of a leader. And that is something that has stayed with us as a culture for a really long time. Like the... Um, Okay, Ethan has a question for you, Michael. I think he's making a mind pipe. The loss of an unladen swallow. An African <laughs> or a European swallow. African or European. My husband just said it. <laughs> okay. yeah. so, um, so it's interesting because Arthur falls in love with Guinevere and um, against Merlin's advice, he decides to marry her and Merlin gives this giant hint by her very beauty shall come the end of Logris. Well, hello. I mean, Arthur has seen Merlin be right over and over again, but he still ignores him. So Arthur's mm. going to get married on the feast of Pentecost, which is, it comes after Easter and it so commemorates when the gift of the Holy ghost is given to Christ's followers. And in Christian tradition, it, 
signifies the beginning, the establishment of the actual church, like as opposed to just Jesus walking around teaching that the Feast of Pentecost commemorates the establishment of a church. And in Camelot, it represents the beginning of Camelot, like Camelot begins here. And they have the round table is brought in. It seats 150 knights. So I think sometimes we get this idea of the round table is like, you know, a table for eight at Olive Garden. But that is not what it was like, right? 150 nights. And there were, okay. <laughs> and the chairs were called sieges. And I want to explain that in case um, people are unfamiliar. So the word seems odd now to be called a siege um, because we associate siege with like laying siege to a castle or something when, when you're at war. And, um, but it is, it is a word from the French, siege, siege, and it means like to sit down, to be seated. And it, and so a siege is a chair. And in some ways you get this image, right? Of like an army sitting down around a castle. They're not moving. They're not going away, but they're also not charging. They're just sitting there and that's a siege. So um, we've got one of the sieges is called the siege perilous which is meaning if you sit in it unworthily, you will be killed. And it is reserved for the most pure knight ever um, who has not shown up yet, but according to Merlin, will show up. Well, these, see, this is another situation where all these superlatives are becoming impossible because the Arthur is the knight. best knight ever. <laughs> oh, oh. How, Arthur's the best knight ever, so how sit it? not his chair? <laughs> it, it doesn't say that if the siege perilous is for the best night ever, it says it's like for the most, like the most righteous night ever, like most pure night or something like that, doesn't it? The best night of all. The best night of all. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> Arthur was the best night, but he uh, gave it up for a girl, which is another this, life lesson. Uh, this, there is an interesting there's two things that strike me about this situation. One is the order of events. So Arthur in many ways is seen as a great lawgiver, but he established peace before he establishes the law and he establishes peace before he organizes his s troops into a relatively democratic, like e equal level. So peace came first. Um, the other thing is, what is it up with the most beautiful person causing so many problems? <laughs> so this Trojan War is a great example of this because oh, yeah. most people know, you know, the fairest woman of all, of course, is the one who kickstarts the war itself. But what Alan. people don't also realize is Paris, in most myths, is the most attractive dude mm -hmm. on that's the entire right. planet. Yeah. That's the reason he's chosen to judge the goddesses. <laughs> yeah. And that is not to be trusted in literature. Beauty is almost always a mirage. It is almost mm. always a facade. It is almost always the deadly path. It, it really is. Beauty is almost always to be avoided at all costs. Um, so we have this very weird scene that happens here in chapter three, where a white heart, which is another word for deer, mm. runs into the hall and is running around and it's chased by a white brochet, which is a, a female hunting dog that tracks by scent, like a hound, like a scent hound. And then that is followed by 60 black hounds. Um, ooh, what about the sirens? Like learning you into your future. Yep. Okay. Mm. The apple of discord. Oh, you guys are all picking this up. Um, mm. Okay. I was watching this video and she mentioned how every time there's a cute boy, they turn into a flower. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. That's um, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so weird because it's just like this almost like slapstick comedy if you let yourself yeah. see this in your mind's eye that got this beautiful new like table shakespeare and to pentecost and we're establishing this wonderful kingdom on earth utopia oh wait release the hounds you know like here come these a deer and dogs running around and so um so then sir avalis grabs the brochet, that first white dog, and leaves. And then in comes a beautiful damsel, of course, in white, and says she wants her brochet back. And the strange knight takes the woman out. And Arthur is happy because um, she was loud. 
it's just so funny. Like Arthur was glad she was gone because she was loud. <laughs> like, no, you got to fix this. And so Sir Gawain, who is Arthur's nephew, goes to bring back the deer. And I think, Michael, you asked earlier, like, do each of them have an inciting incident? And for mm -hmm. Sir Gawain, this is it. Um, mm -hmm. Because he is changed forever by this quest. So he goes. I love and this then one event happens. And then Arthur's like, let me dispatch all of my knights. Everyone can handle a tiny facet of this adventure. Yes, that's exactly what happens. But <laughs> I do think that this is a problem. So, um, so the three quests are supposed to be um, cause Merlin tells Arthur, no, you got to go fix this. So, um, Sir Gawain goes to bring back the deer. Sir Tor, who is the son of Sir Pelinor goes to get the brochet. And then King Pelinor is supposed to go get the knight and the damsel. All right. So the first thing that this sets up is that Sir Gawain accidentally cuts off the head of a woman when she flung herself on top of her husband to try to protect him. And so then he takes the headless body back to Camelot, <laughs> leading later to a hysterical scene where King Arthur is talking to other people at the table. And then he says, so Sir Gawain, tell us about this headless woman that you have next to you. Like, just like randomly, like, tell us about this new watch that you've got. Like, here he is sitting at the table. Uh oh, Michael disappeared. Um, Hopefully he comes back. It was just so funny. So then the next of the three that comes is, um, welcome back, Michael. Sorry about um, that. I guess you went out on a quest. And then, um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I didn't kill anybody. So. <laughs> oh, it was so crazy. So, um, so it's just so funny. Okay. So then um, after Sir Gawain is uh, Sir Tor, and he ends up killing the bad guy and rides back with his new dwarf servant and dwarfs as in this politically correct, um, politically incorrect thing. They're always like the helper person. Um, and so it's so, to me, this is a mistake because um, why is it fine that he showed no mercy to Abelis, but Gawain's life is destroyed because he showed no mercy. Mm. Like, I guess it yeah. shows the life isn't fair. Not that okay. he always has it the same. It just feels yeah. weird. It just feels weird. <laughs> that sort of <laughs> rules can fluctuate. Well, this, there is something slightly different here, which is that Abelis is slain at the big hest of a lady whereas oh. Gawain shows no mercy and ends up killing a lady so the real mm. it appears that killing knights only is okay as long as ladies agree with it <laughs> which means like that the bachelorette uh. would have been far more bloody if these guys had been in charge of it it's like <laughs> 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 So, so I yeah, mean, it was a very gruesome time. So it you know. was very gruesome times. So <laughs> then the last one is King Pelinor, and he is so focused on finding of his task on finding Lady Nimue, which doesn't even make sense to me because that isn't really the task that he was set out on. When Arthur first gave him the task, he I was a bit confused by that. Yeah, he was supposed to go get the knight and the damsel. Because is the damsel Nimue? And they didn't mention it or something? That seems just, like a big important thing to leave out. Yeah, kind of. And Nimue is magic. If somebody took her brochet, she'd just be like, dude, I want my brochet right. back. Right? But like, it's King Arthur, right? I mean. But it's Arthur. Well, so stealing stuff from Nimue. Didn't somebody already steal her sword? Somebody stole her mm. sword. Like she's like she's like and the anti klepto. Well, like not only yeah. that, but when people steal her stuff, it becomes low key cursed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, uh, like leave, leave. Okay. Don't steal. Ethan is cracking me up tonight. <laughs> You're a sinner. I'll take you. It'll be <laughs> fine. I'm sure it'll be fine. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Well, I the the country. King Arthur's oh. t shirt. But while we're talking about t shirts, you guys look. A, people in the class, a couple of students in the class, siblings, had this t-shirt made for me and sent it to me. Do you that see it? That is awesome. Pencil that says Mrs. Van Star. Earlier <laughs> today, I did a live stream for teachers and I wore it. So I've been wearing it all day. I love it <laughs> so much. And guess what? Next live stream, 
I'm wearing another shirt that someone sent me and it will blow your mind. So wait until July 2nd, I'm gonna blow your mind. <laughs> All right, so, um, so he's so focused on finding Lady Nimue that he can't he wouldn't help this damsel in distress. She ends up killing herself over grief because her knight dies and because King Pelinor wouldn't help. And then we find out from Merlin later that it was his own daughter. And I just, yes. I feel like it jumps the shark in this moment. Mm. Like, I feel like if, if you don't know that phrase, um, there used to be this old TV show called Happy Days. And mm. Happy Days, as this story went on and on and on, it kept getting sillier and sillier. And then there was <laughs> one episode where this one character named Fonzie goes water skiing and jumps over a shark. And the phrase jump the shark <laughs> when the series just goes so ridiculous, you can't believe it anymore. And I feel like this is an issue here because it is just not believable to me that King Pelinor mm. is going to face his own daughter face to face. Like she's not in disguise. He's on disguise and he does not recognize I her. I think the idea was that he had been questing his whole life for her. That There's, he had lost they her explicitly early mentioned that. Yeah, it says, I, I wanted to see the exact wording there. So he's never so met his own daughter? For the lady sure, was your own daughter, Aline, whom you have fought these legend. many years. Oh, whom you have and, the, and her husband mm -hmm. was the good knight Sir Miles of Landis, which means she's been missing so long, she got married and he didn't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah, all right, we can do that. Um, it does feel like this whole thing I was a bit rushed, though. Funny. Like, he was trying to cram a bunch of quests into a really short space and didn't like... This is another part where he didn't really describe it very thoroughly. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I agree. So it's in this chapter that the order of chivalry gets set up, which actually has guided social interaction in our culture ever since. Mm. Like if you want to look at the root of why men open doors for women or pull out chairs, it is all here. Um, I love the kind of chivalry. Yeah. So, um, oh, Ethan, you know, it would be super funny as if they made <laughs> <laughs> a reality TV show. Would be the best. That would make a good reality TV show. It really would. Okay, so our last chapter oh for tonight, in our last few minutes, um, is the magic of Nimue and Morgan Le Fay. So, um, it's so weird because Merlin clearly knows what Nimue is going to do. She's going to essentially bury him alive, not to kill him, but to leave <laughs> him in like this magical suspended animation for centuries, mm. and. Um, he goes anyway, because I guess hashtag destiny, right. um, Paul, hashtag destiny. Marilyn's like, and if I'm going to be dishing up destiny to everybody else, I might as well follow mine. Exactly. Right. Like, I don't want to be a hypocrite. But I do think there's some hypocrisy because Nimue says to Merlin, oh, I've got to go back and help Arthur out because Morgan Le Fay is going to come do some crazy wild magic with him. And... Um, and I got to go protect him. Ignore the fact that I've been doing crazy magic with you and now you're <laughs> under. <laughs> like, it's just kind of like, okay, uh, so her magic is good. And then we get the we get this one weird scene in, in all of chapter four where these three guys go off questing, including King Arthur, and they get on this random magic ship as you <laughs> <laughs> and they go to sleep and they all wake up in different places. And Urians wakes up in Camelot with his wife, Morgan Le Fay, who mm. hashtag bad marriage choice. And <laughs> Arthur is in prison and Sir Accolon wakes up in a pleasant courtyard and luckily didn't fall down the deep well he was next to. And so, of course, in another case of mistaken identity, Arthur and Accolon get in this fight and they both think they have Excalibur and they almost kill each other. And... Angelon dies of his wounds, but Arthur lives. So there's just one more mistaken identity. But then Morgan Le Fay decides to kill her husband while he naps. Um, and I think one of the best lessons from the book so far is do not ever, under any circumstances whatsoever, go to sleep in the vicinity of Morgan Le Fay. <laughs> it is not safe. Take no dose, drink a Coke, whatever it takes. But do not, um, okay, Ethan, man, Ethan, Ethan is my MVP. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, yeah. I wanted to point out, like, uh, right before they get in the ship, uh, there's a really funny paragraph where it says that they're chasing a heart, and they ride so fast and so hard that their horses fall dead under them. 
but it's no matter because the heart was so tired that it was basically dead as well. It died anyway. It's weird, I know. but. So it's fine. All of our horses are dead. We're out in the middle of nowhere, but the deer <laughs> dropped dead, so it's all good. Let's climb into a ship. <laughs> it's weird too because they're so nonchalant. These horses right. would have been very expensive. Yes, they yes. had more than the deer. No yes. question. <laughs> and so, the horses were dead under them. It's, One it's, thing. Do you ride that, a horse that hard? I've never ridden a horse, but I'm pretty sure it would take a good deal of riding for a horse to actually die while you're riding it. Well, if we're gonna go back to Lord of the Rings illusions, it's definitely like shadow facts that would never happen to shadow facts. Like he would go mm -hmm. forever. Um. I think one of the interesting parts is when Morgan Le Fay throws the scabbard of Excalibur into the middle of the deep lake. And I think that one of the things that we see in Arthurian legend and in a lot of stories is that the evil people or characters have more respect for stuff than sometimes the good characters do. Mm. Sometimes the evil have more respect for the good than the good have respect for the power of the good. That's funny. All right. Um, this one confused me slightly because I drew the wrong lesson initially because I didn't realize that Nimue was alive again. Okay. Despite having her head cut off earlier, she's yeah. back and kicking and doing stuff and being rescued. Because mm. when I saw that Morgan Le Fay chucked the scabbard into the lake, I was like, well, Arthur, you should have kept the Lady of the Lake alive because, boy, could mm. she just toss that right back to you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's her home turf. Mm. So like, the last thing that funny. happens, in Boca well, well, we don't know that it's her lake. It just says the deep lake in the forest. Yeah, but it feels like Lady of the Lake. The Lady of all the lakes. Then anyway, could it's a it's a deep lake. That's her turf, you know. Robin Hood. Mark, kind of thing. It's you're her so lake. right, Mark. Oh, by the way, so I didn't realize that you were having a class for Lamb to the Slaughter, and that's why I missed it. And I was so I didn't sad. realize that you were having a class. I feel so, so bad. I'm glad that you're it's and it and Michael can be he gets a um excused absence for that because I normally send a special email out to a few people and I didn't that time, assuming mm. that all of them were on this other list. And so anyway, mm. that was my fault. It's my fault that we did not get Michael's insight into land to the slaughter. Mm. Um except that I do always announce the day of the next class. Yeah, but I never pay attention, so that's my fault. <laughs> my husband just said, please like and subscribe. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, the last thing that happens in book one is that Morgan Le Fay tries to kill Arthur with a cursed cape, and he's saved by Lady Nimue, mm -hmm. and Morgan goes to her castle and fortified it strongly. And so my last question for you guys is, do you think that there is anything that Arthur could have done to really protect himself from Morgan Le Fay. Is there anything that he's done wrong to this point vis-a-vis -vis Morgan Le Fay? Oh yeah. Mm. Number one issue is he knows she's his enemy and he hasn't told anybody. Mm. Like, I mean, I feel yeah, like probably... nobody knows, nobody seems to realize, by the way, this is a persona non grat, like no go more. She is not welcome. She is an enemy of the crown. Like, this isn't published, this isn't declared. And mm. like the whole, she steals the scabbard because the people were like, oh, she was your sister. They wouldn't yeah. have, they wouldn't See, have I feel, him if I, everybody knew that she was not his friend. Yeah, why isn't he, she on most wanted posters all I over? I feel like if he had done something, she probably would have found some way to get oh, yeah. around I mean, it. Fate but. is fate, destiny's destiny. Well, she was like, a master of disguise. I mean, she mm. does, we don't really see that yet, but she does disguise. You can at um, least make it difficult. Like, yeah. I he mean, left the door unlocked. It's mm, really true. the root of all evil <laughs> is that like, um, like the idea of usurped power because mm. she, like she was the rightful daughter of a king and had Arthur not been born, she would have perhaps been the queen. Not in this myth, I don't think. In this one, all three of those women are reputed to be daughters of the other dude. Of Uther Pendragon, who was- No, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Right, because Morgan Le Fay's his half-sister. No, yes. they're, they're all, sister. they're daughters of- uh, Of his wife before. Goloyus. But I think that they're they're Uther Pendragon's daughters. That's no, why not, they're- Not in this story. Not? It's, it's explicit, not. in fact, yeah. it's explicit that only one child was born to Uther and- See, I wasn't thinking about that. The but other yeah, three right. are all the daughters of, it says right there, Uther had no other children, though Igraine and Gorlois had three daughters. And then it names them. In this particular telling, 
they are not heirs. Okay, no. Okay, but wasn't but okay. They're so I messed that up. But well, wasn't for half, long, half oh no, it was the Duke. Stepchildren. All right, never mind. Then I'm wrong. Okay. okay. It well, might be the, it might be one of those things that changes in different retellings, and so you've read a bunch where they were his. Well, nice full attempt sisters. to save me, but I think I'm just wrong. Um, but the only one child is is interesting. Oh, we also met Lancelot in here. I didn't mention it. Thinking of only one child, Lancelot, who's going to be a problem it. later. Um, okay, so next class, next class, July second. I'll put it in the chat again. July second. Same bat time, same bat channel. We'll be doing book two. So if you haven't had a chance yet to get the book, go ahead. I will say um, the next section is the longest of all four sections of the book. So you'll want to give yourself a little more time. I also want to recommend one other thing, which is if you're having trouble like getting into it or you love it so much, you want more. Um, there are some, if you go to your friendly neighborhood public library, you're going to see lots about King Arthur available. I've mentioned a few. Um, I'll, I'll type a comment. Uh, the Once and Future King is perhaps the Somebody mentioned that further up in the comments. Best known. Yeah, the Once and Future King is probably the best known. It focuses a lot more on Merlin than this story does, and he has a bigger role. It also is a lot more emphasis on magic. Um, and then um, I like, like if you are more interested in kind of a fun take on it, Usborne has the illustrated tales of King Arthur and it's a very easy read and it has like pretty illustrations, but it's definitely made for younger, a younger crowd. Um, so if you want something easier to do, the Usborne is good. If you want something more challenging that, and then as I mentioned earlier, the kind of, um, PG-13 in a sense, because it's a lot more violent, is um, is um, Sword at Sunset. Now, somebody posted, my favorite is a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. That yes, book. that is another good one. That's Mark Twain. And so then you- sort of, and then sort of I, unrelated. I mean, it's not entirely related, but the, um, the series that begins uh, with the book, Oversee Under Stone, that's based on Arthurian legend. It's- Okay. Loosely, so it it's about modern kids. I mean, it was written in the '80s, but it's about modern kids rediscovering artifacts that are supposed to be from Arthurian times. Uh, okay, I found those really interesting. If you want to like get into the, I don't know, if what you call it, like the extended uh, universe. Um. Let's see. I'm have yes. Okay, I have the one you put in the bio. Will that work? Yes, absolutely. The one in the bio is the one we're reading. I just put a link to a website called kingarthursnights.com. And that's my favorite site online for finding like digestible amounts of information, but is very complete about um, King Arthur. So if you're interested in learning more and you don't want to get a book, you can go find more information there on that one. So the one that we're reading for class, I'm just giving lots of extras in case you really like it and you want to get into it. Um, Michael, do you think you could type the name of the one you're talking about? Yeah, in I'm the going chat? to. Okay, um, this is the one that we're reading and we'll be reading book two, book two. And I really like all of your defense of the longer stuff. So the dark is rising sequence. That sounds really interesting. Well, I want to thank you both, Jonathan and Michael for being here. Um, Oh, Ethan said a special offer, buy two and get them both at full price. So that's cool. Oh, that's not a special offer, Ethan. Say what? Not. <laughs> You're not. <laughs> and, and you were my MVP. <laughs> so um, you guys, thank you so much. I loved this format. This was super fun. Yeah, this is and definitely an interesting, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you for joining Great in. Day. I love having this new platform where I can highlight the, the comments because I think that's fun. So yeah. you guys enjoy your weekend and um, I will uh, see you guys on July 2nd after my husband and I take a cruise to the Bahamas. Ooh, nice. I know. And Jonathan, the van son, gets to babysit the dog. I get to borrow the dog. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You guys take care and Alrighty. we'll see you, you later. Too.
All righty. Thanks for having class. Thank you. you Thanks for joining in. Right. Take Thanks care. You. Oh yeah. Let me say one more thing before I'm, I'm like not really leaving yet. If you would like to participate like Michael and Jonathan did tonight, let me know and we can try to make that happen. Okay. We'll talk to you later.